Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome. I um, hope you're all keeping safe and well. I'm Will Sibley from Leaf, and I'm really thrilled to be introducing once again um, a Leaf surgery. Just for those who have not attended Leaf surgery before, we deliver regular online webinars with our guest speakers um, for our members. And initially, these were set up during the first lockdown in 2020. We've never looked back. Um, we really enjoyed. Um, having guest speakers as well as covering um, some really interesting topics that are, are relevant to um, all in the food and farming industry. Um, so for this um, session we will be focusing on two emerging technological innovations um, designed to feed food security, um, those being vertical crop farming, insect farming, and we've got two, two guests here who will bring their expert insights um, and just explore the kind of potential opportunities and potential issues from these two um, innovations for, for the industry. So um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jen Bromley, um, Chief Research Officer at Vertical Future. Jen is the former head of Gene Discovery and Computational Biology at British American Tobacco. Um, and Vertical Futures are a vertical farming technology and R&D company um, with a quite global reach now since they started in 2016 and with a small vertical farm in South London. Um, so welcome, Jen, and Jen will be covering the vertical farming side. Also, I'm delighted to welcome Adam Banks, founder of Insta Farming and Bug Vita. Or Bug Vita. Um, and after working quite a bit in Mexico and experiencing the cuisine there, and I expect eating quite a lot of insects, um, Adam was awarded an Uffield Farming Scholarship to study what opportunities there might be for insect farming in the UK um, and launched Insta Farming, um, which is a cricket farm. Um, and now that's grown into Bug Vita. And now they're processing crickets into fine powder, which is really interesting. So welcome to you, Adam, um, and welcome to both of you. I'm really looking forward to, to what we'll cover. Um, and our very own um, Vicky Robinson, Leaf Technical Director, will be chairing today's session, as well as giving, um, I guess, a, a quick update or um, on current affairs or how to keep up with the current affairs um, and some context around today's session. Um, so as usual, please do um, pop in your questions we'd love to hear from you so put those in the chat it should be somewhere bottom right um either send them to me or the whole group um and then we've saved some time at the end to for a q a so um enjoy and uh, without further delay over to you vicky brilliant thanks will and yes welcome everyone it's great to see you all and also say welcome to, to jen and adam and I'm incredibly excited to be hosting this leaf surgery, um, which is looking at some of the emerging technologies um, to support nutritional security in the UK. And, you know, as, as is traditional leaf sur surgery, just reflecting on the last couple of weeks since our last one, it's been conference season for the political parties. And I think it's fair to say that there has been some turmoil, which still seems to be ongoing. I'm trying to trying to keep up with it. Um, and it's created a sense of uncertainty about the future direction of ag policy in England. Um, and at the same time, we've got Scotland. Um, consulting on its agricultural bill and um, the Welsh government as well is consulting its sustainable farming scheme. So as always, there seems to be a huge amount going on. But on a positive note, it's also awards season um, with a celebration at the Farmers Weekly Awards last week and the British Farming Awards next week. And you know, it's a real chance to reflect on the diverse systems and inspirational people we have in our industry. So it's been a fantastic to, to see that. And on the theme of inspiration, our surgery today is considering two of the newer business approaches in UK farming, providing us with the opportunity to ask some questions about how they will contribute towards nutritional security, land use, the environment and food waste in the UK. And technology and new approaches in agriculture are nothing new. And as an industry, we've embraced the opportunities they provided. And sort of going back, you think to the industrial revolution with the introduction of agricultural machinery, and then through the last century with the development of synthetic products and to more recent times with a focus on, decision, uh, on digital and precision agriculture. And technology can be transformative. And today we have a fantastic opportunity to find out more about vertical farming and insect farming and how they fit into the wide range of farming systems we have in the UK. 
And obviously food security and nutritional security is also increasingly on our political and social agendas. And in the UK, 48% of the food we consume is imported. And as we've seen recently, the impacts both of climate change and the geopolitical issues have the potential to disrupt our global supply chains. And you know, as a result, you know, the UK government have committed to producing a food security report every three years. And the FAO report said that during 2020 to 2021, almost one in three people globally did not have access to adequate food and COVID has increased food insecurity. So without further ado, the format for today, I'm gonna to ask Jen and Adam a few questions that I've got. And then as Will said, we'll open up to the floor. So please do pop questions in chat as we're going so that we can pick up on those. So my first question, I've got a question for Jen and a question for Adam. So Jen, first of all, please could you explain how vertical farming works and the types and volumes of produce it grows or has the potential to grow? So I thought one of the easiest things for me to do was rather than uh, trying to explain to you what a vertical farm looks like, is rather than you see what state my office is in and how disarrayed my filing system is, actually behind me I've put a, a picture of one of our facilities that's currently under commissioning. Um, so this is a typical vertical farm that Vertical Future produce. You can see that there's multiple layers of growing area. Um, each one is actually very, very close uh, to the one above. So we're typically looking in this particular farm, which is set up for um, baby leaf uh, type crops. Typically between the growing surface and the light canopy, we're looking at a maximum of 350 millimetres but in some cases it's a lot smaller than that. Um, what we're able to grow, um, actually, sorry, let's carry on with sort of how we grow. Um, so we provide artificial light. Um, the spectra of the light can be tailored. So you can see from the lights behind me, these are all the same lighting panel. We've just programmed them to work differently. So we can really tune the color and the intensity of the light to fit with the needs of the crop. Um, that allows us to sometimes reduce the growing cycle, but it can also allow us to impart different beneficial um, aspects to that plant. So whether that be improved antioxidants, whether that be a certain leaf shape or structure, we're able to do that. Um, the types of produce that it grows, um, at the moment, vertical farming is really being used, I'm going to say in anger, uh, not so much in anger, but in sort of joy, um, mainly for leafy crops. So things like herbs, salads, um, and you know, microgreens is really where the industry started into those particularly high value crops. Um, but with sort of technological developments and sort of the forward research uh, that groups like mine are doing within the industry, we're able to really sort of drive down the costs of vertical farming, which means that you can start entering sectors like so, you know, your typical bagged salad um, and ready to eat sectors. Um, but we're not just you know, resting on our laurels and saying, OK, it's great for sort of, you know, your sort of typical protected crops. Where are we going beyond that? We're starting to look into new sectors um, and actually it's, it dovetails quite nicely with Adam, um, who's also on the call. And um, we're looking at, you know, opportunities to produce uh, protein from leaf in vertical farms and how you can do that. We're looking at the opportunities to use vertical farms to produce plant derived pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals and cosmetics flavours, um, things that go into downstream processing. So there's a real range of different crops. We're even starting to do research into root crops. Um, you may have seen reports, people are using vertical farms to produce seedlings, to uh, sort of like support reforesting. Um, people are using vertical farms to produce seedlings and uh, other plants that can then go out into fields. So they're not necessarily an end-to-end -end system. They can just be the start of a life for a plant, which then goes outside or into uh, another growing environment. Brilliant. No, that's fantastic, Jen. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. I think especially sort of thinking about root crops um, and actually, as you say, the, what the wider, the wider pod range of products that they can support. So, Adam, over to you. So what is insect farming and why and how did you begin farming insects as livestock? Well, thank you, Vicky. Good morning, everyone. Um, so insect farming is literally the, the process of mass rearing insects. And that might be for feed or food, but it could also be for the products that they produce, um, honey, dyes, silk, for example. Um, and people have been, because you know, we, we talk about um, how insect farming is new and novel, um, but people have been farming insects for 
for about 5,000 years. And um, people have been eating insects throughout our evolutionary history, going back to our earliest ancestors. So this sort of the idea of producing insects and eating insects um, really isn't new, but it's the, the, the scale and the technology that's involved at the, you know, that is really taking that to the next level. Um, so farming insects for human consumption, which is what I'm primarily involved in, um, started in a big way in Thailand in the 1990s. And that was uh, in response to the economic crisis there and uh, food insecurity. Um, and it's sort of grown from there, really. Um, and uh, so I, I lived in Mexico for, for a spell, as, as Will mentioned. And, and that's really where I first came across this idea of eating insects. Um, so in Mexico City, you have uh, Eskimoles, which are ant larvae and ant pupae, which are fried up. And that's so sort of often called Mexican caviar, which is actually quite delicious. And then over in Oaxaca, you, you might eat chapulines, which are uh, a kind of grasshopper. So I came back from Mexico um, uh, to the UK. Um, I, I was I was actually out there doing nothing to do with farming really at all. I worked as a uh, a reinsurance loss adjuster, so I dealt with insurance claims for reinsurance companies over in Mexico. So it was really quite a, a shift in a different direction to uh, to get into insect farming. Um, although I am from a from a sort of farming family originally, and um, and so yeah, I, I I wanted to take that sort of cultural acceptance of eating insects and the idea of eating insects and see whether uh, you know I could make a business of it in the UK. Um, so yeah, I mean that's just uh, really what insect farming is and, and how I how I got into it. Yeah, no, that's great, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, so question question for both of you, um, and I think yeah, is what role do you see vertical farming and insect farming playing in the food landscape of the UK and in supporting our nutritional um, security? And that's both now and obviously thinking as we go ahead um, into the future. So Jen, if I could come to you first for that one, then I'll come to Adam. So I suppose one of the critical uh, advantages of vertical farming is that we don't have seasons. Every every day is the peak growing day that your crop needs, whether that's in July, whether that's in December, uh, whether there's you know a couple of inches of snow on the ground outside, or whether we're suffering from you know some serious heat waves. The environment inside the vertical farm is consistent year round, and it's tailored to the crop. So we have year round growth. Um, that massively reduces the nation's reliance on imports. Um, and allows year round income for the operator of the vertical farm. Um, it also allows predictability of supply chain as well. Um, you know, if you've got a large off taker who's looking for a certain level of tonnage per week of a particular crop or a particular product that they're, they're sort of they're selling on, then you, you're able to predict it very, very well and you're able to plan for that. Um, also, as the environment's completely controlled, um, we do see a lot less wastage. Um, we don't suffer from disease. Soil-borne disease is, is not a thing because we don't have soil in a vertical farm. Um, all of our water um, that we're using in the vertical farm, you know, whether that's through rain, rainwater harvesting or whether that's uh, coming through boreholes, uh, etc., we filter it and we treat it to make sure that that water um, isn't bringing anything in that's going to contaminate the crop. Um, Again, that reduces the waste associated with production and it allows a much more um, predictable yield per metre squared, um, which means that you've always got that, you know, that tick over of, of crop um, being on the farm and then coming out of the farm. And because we've got this uh, year round, you know, continuous environment, what you can do is you can, you know, you can sow um, like daily, weekly, um, fortnightly depending on when your uh, crop cycles are due to due to end um, and when your harvests need to happen so you can really sort of tailor it down to you know finally to the day as to when things need to happen um, which I think is is very much sort of supports nutritional security and food security in the UK. Oh, thank you and, and Adam same question to you. 
Well, right now, um, insects, both for feed and food, um, play a, a very small role, really, in our in our food landscape in the UK. Um, the uh, you know that is changing. I think it's probably changing faster for insects for animal feed than it is insects for human consumption. Um, I mean, just for example, I think if you were to take um, the uh, UK production of uh, insects for human consumption, uh, I imagine the total volume being produced would not be dissimilar to um, the output of a typical um, broiler farm. You know, it, it's really not, uh, it, it's really, you know, it's niche and it's quite small, um, but I think it does have potential to grow quite significantly. Um, and, you know, insects uh, in themselves are inherently more efficient um, to produce than traditional livestock. So if you're looking to um, rear insects for human consumption, even if those insects were being fed uh, a feedstock that you know, would be similar to say a poultry feed that was going into chickens, you would get a, a better output from those insects. So as a way of producing protein for people to eat, um, it is a more efficient way of doing it. Um, looking at animal feed, I mean, there's uh, an argument to say that um, you know, th there's some inherent inefficiencies in taking um, a, a, a something, some feedstock to feed insects, to then feed animals, to then feed people. I mean, there's a whole uh, extra step there of, of energy loss. Um, that said, if you can take waste streams and feed those to insects, which can then go on to feed anim animals or fish, pigs, poultry for human consumption, then um, that is potentially more efficient. Although <clears throat> I think the regulations do need to catch up in that regard. Um, now, um, there's a serious barrier in the West to, um, uh, to, to adopting insects, particularly for human consumption. The, the yuck factor, which is apparently a, a scientific term, um, is very real. There's like a, a real cultural aversion to eating insects in, in, in the UK, in Europe, in North America that doesn't exist um, in other parts of the world. But for it to ever become uh, mainstream or widespread, it's something that we would have to get over. And I think um, the, the key there is probably how we go about introducing uh, children to the idea of eating insects, because these um, sort of uh, associations with food develop, um, they, are, they are developed by the time you're sort of 12, 13, 14 years old. So if you haven't been exposed to the idea of eating insects by then, or perhaps you uh, have some sort of negative uh, connotations, then it's going to be much harder to overcome that later in life. So I think that's one of the reasons why um, it, you know, even though businesses in the UK have been trying to persuade people to eat insects since about sort of 2013, uh, it hasn't really grown in, a, in, a, in, a, in an exponential way, it has been quite slow and steady. So hopefully that slow and steady growth will continue into the future. And like I say, I think with the um, animal feed side, the growth will probably be quicker as long as the regulations can catch up in terms of what you can feed the insects. Yeah, no, I can I can see that yuck factor being being a challenge. I can't see my getting my children to eat an insect if it looked like an insect anyway. So <laughs> that's yeah, so it's really interesting that whole what we consider the norm um, in in our food environment. Um, now, sort of on the environmental side, I'm making the assumption might be totally wrong that both you know vertical um, and insect farming is energy you know is, is energy intensive. So I'm just really interested in, in in the the impact obviously of the current high costs of energy on your business, but also actually how you're working on moving towards you know, um, zero carbon emissions or, or, or net zero. So um, Adam, if I come to you first and then Jen, I'll, I'll come to you on that one. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the, the probably, to st I should probably start by saying <clears throat> that there needs to be better data on um, the environmental impact of insect farming. So there needs to be more life cycle analyses done looking at um, emissions and inputs. That said, I think um, the, 
you know, the, there is the necessary, you know, in the past, there has been um, uh, uh, this sort of uh, idea that farming a tropical insect in a temperate climate, which is what you're doing if you're farming, say, crickets in the UK, um, that that is, uh, you know, perhaps energy intensive. Um, and it can be because you have to uh, heat the environment you're farming the insects in. So let's say you're farming crickets, you're probably heating that environment to 32 degrees C, which is uh, pretty warm. And, um, you know, if you're just using a shed like you might, you know, farm poultry, and then it's going to be incredibly inefficient. Um, but there is potential to build, uh, to develop systems of farming insects, which are more energy efficient and closer to, um, uh, sort of carbon neutral. Um, and when you uh, look at the amount of energy that an insect actually produces itself through uh, respiration, you know, you, if an adult cricket, for example, um, will produce about 0 0.003 watts of energy um, just in uh, existing, um, which doesn't sound like very much, but when you have um, millions of insects being reared at quite a high population density, then that's quite a significant amount of heat that those adult crickets are producing. So in a well insulated space where um, you can uh, capture some of that heat that might be lost, you can actually recirculate um, the, the, the warm air, bring in uh, the oxygen that you need, get rid of the CO2, and you can actually develop a very efficient system. So when a cricket first hatches out, they're called a newly hatched cricket. It's called a pinhead because it's really so tiny, and um, they are going to be needing a lot of heat. And you can potentially capture some of the heat from the, uh, you know, the older generations of crickets and reuse that in the system. And the same goes with mealworms, black soldier fly larvae. Um, and so, yeah, I think the um, you know, some of the, uh, the sort of preconceptions about how energy intensive it is to produce insects uh, are probably have more to do with the uh, type of buildings that they were that have you know been raised in in the past. No, that's great. No, but yeah, that sort of circular um, ability to capture that heat. That's um, yeah. No, that I, I didn't realise that. So that's yeah. That's really interesting. Um, and and um, so Jen, what? How about vertical vertical farming? I mean, I would echo what Adam has just said about the the, the building quality, the insulation of a building that uh, a vertical farm is, is um, installed within is incredibly important. Um, making It's much much like your home insulation is incredibly important to reduce the amount of energy you're using. Same, same with a vertical farm, by having a very good mu value of your building, um, the energy that you consume is significantly lower. And you know, I can't, I can't lie, you do have to do uh, use energy inputs to uh, produce crops in a vertical farm. The environment is totally controlled. There are no sort of external um, dependencies here. Uh, it's all, you know, under the control of a central um, computer system that's operating the farm. Um, that having said that, you know, we, we are using energy, but there are lots of opportunities to, to link into green energy. Um, the farm that I'm showing behind me is actually linked in with a solar farm. Um, people have installed wind uh, and pyrolysis on site. Um, anaerobic digestion is another great source uh, that we're able to tap into for energy needs because we can use, you know, it's not just energy in the form of electricity, but you can use energy uh, for your heat as well. And we frequently um, use high efficiency um, air source heat pumps, uh, which enable us to essentially harvest um, heat and cool from the air and use that appropriately within the vertical farm. So there's a lot of, lot of opportunity to use more green energy sources. Um, and there's been a lot of work across the industry um, to associate uh, this type of production with green energy tariffs as well. So there's, there are essentially vertical farming specific green energy tariffs available too. Um, having just said all that about energy, there are also the level of control that we have also means there's a lot of inputs that we don't need. Um, and that has, if you know, if you look at the full life cycle analysis of, of a crop, um, there's a lot of inputs we don't need. So we don't use pesticides. We don't have to use pesticides because we totally control the environment. There's no herbicides and no fungicides are used within the growth cycle of a crop. Um, that has a massive impact on the energy use if you look at the full life cycle of your crop. Um, 
there are also other things that we can do to be more energy efficient. I mentioned earlier our lights and the variability of the spectrum that we have. Um, we do something quite different to um, the vast majority of people um, and technology providers within vertical farming. Um, our lights are actually low wattage rather than high wattage. Um, this means that they're a lot cheaper to run from a sort of a cost per kilowatt hour perspective uh, because they use fewer kilowatts. Um, but also what it means is we're not producing excess heat because typically a very bright bulb will produce a lot of heat. And that means you have to locate the bulb further away from the canopy of your plant in order to prevent any sort of burn happening to the leaf that you're growing below it. Um, and burn in sort of, you know, leafy salads and herbs and things is very much something you want to avoid. Um, but because our lights are a lot lower wattage, it means that they don't produce as much heat, which means that we can actually locate the canopy a lot closer. So the canopy of light closer to the canopy of the plant. What that also means is we're being much more efficient with our light conversion. Um, light follows an inverse square rule. So the, from the source, there's an inverse square of how it dissipates before it hits the canopy. You can have the canopy closer to the source, you're losing a lot less. Now light dissipates as heat, and when you lose energy as heat in a vertical farm, when you've got a controlled environment, you actually have to put in more energy to cool, to reduce the heat that you're losing. So by not losing energy as heat from our lights, what we're able to do is reduce the amount of energy that we need to put in to maintain the environment. Um, and so by thinking about it in a whole systems method, we've been able to reduce the amount of energy that you need to operate the system. Um, we're also able to control the intensity and the photo period of the lights as well. And that's something that's become very, very interesting uh, in the last sort of, sort of year or so worth of research that we've been doing. Um, we now very, very closely look at our farm output, not just in strict yield, not just in terms of the kilos per meter squared that we're producing, but we look at them in terms of kilos per kilowatt hour per meter squared. Um, because really that's sort of looking at the prof profitability of your system. If you're just simply looking at kilos, you can throw loads of energy at it and you can up your yield a bit, but your profitability reduces. So by being clever and thinking about how you can maximize your profitability, even if that means there's a slight impact on your per meter square yield, that's actually much more beneficial. Um, so we've been working to look at what's the difference between providing the same amount of light, so the same total um, like amount of photons hit the plant in eight hours versus 12 hours versus 16. And there's actually quite a surprising improvement in your kilos per kilowatt hour as you start to flex this, uh, this growing uh, day, essentially. And by shortening the growing day, what you're able to do is uh, essentially not have your lights on as much, you can have a longer night. Nights aren't have to be as warm. So you're thinking about your heating and your cooling balance changes. And so actually by changing that photo period, you can change a lot of the energy inputs that are required. And again, that really reduces the energy needs uh, that you're looking at. And that's really sort of very pertinent in today's um, cost of energy sort of climate. Um, the sort of the final thing that I just wanted to cover here is thinking about where you're locating a facility um, by locating things closer to supply hubs, again, looking at your sort of like full life cycle and your energy uses, your use of cold stores becomes a lot less because you're able to ship out to your um, off taker or the supply hub on a daily or weekly basis. Um, that reduces your carbon emissions hugely and your energy use because there's less distance for transport, but also less time in the cold chain as well. Um, there's a lot more I could probably go into, but I'll probably that, that, no, that's great, Jen. Because I've, I've got one more question. Cause I've got I I as I had a lot of questions, but I knew I knew time would go quickly. So if I ask one more question to you both, and then I know that quite a few questions have come in, so I'll hand back to Will. So how and will farm businesses across the across the UK benefit from what you are doing? So Adam, if I come to you first, and then to Jen. Yeah, so I think there's, um, you know, potentially, 
you know, various benefits. I mean, not least amongst them would be just an opportunity to diversify what farmers are doing. And I think, um, uh, you know, having uh, that potential to, to, to sort of spread what the farming industry is doing gives it more resilience. Um, looking at the animal feed side, I think we, at the moment, we're, we're seeing um, most of the investment going into large facilities, um, which are, you know, looking at producing a significant output of insect meal to go into animal feed. Um, I think as, in addition to that, there's probably a lot of scope to see on-site protein production, which um, is going to shorten supply chains and, again, give farmers that a little bit more resilience against the um, fluctuations in, in a global market, which um, you know, I, I think will be useful. Um, and what, what we've also seen um, is, and I might, you know, learn from a farming family, I, I might be an example of this, and certainly other people are, that you have um, new entrants into the farming sector. And I think that just broadens the uh, base of, of, you know, what it means to be a farmer. And um, I think having that broader base, you know, will only strengthen the, the farming industry as a whole. Um, because there are Obviously, some farmers who will say, you know, if you're you haven't got your dairy herd or you're not behind the wheel of a tractor, you know, you, you're not really a proper farmer. But um, you know, certainly an indoor vertical farming system like Jen is talking about uh, in insect farming operation, you know, these people are still farmers, um, and and I think um, looking at government policy as well, it's important that they are recognized as farmers and given the kind of support that farmers uh, would receive because, um, you know, it, although uh, they, you know, it, it's not traditional farming, it is still farming and potentially it's the future of farming. So uh, I think it certainly deserves that support. Yeah, no, brilliant. And yeah, that definition of farmers, yeah, really, really good, good point. Um, so Jen, how about you? I would say one of the main benefits of uh, indoor agriculture and vertical farming is climate resilience. You know, what we're looking at here is a way to ensure that your crop isn't going to fail. You're not going to have sudden surprises um, of uh, a sudden heat wave like last summer or drought um, impacting your crop. Um, the water use efficiency and the sort of the nutrient use efficiency um, that a vertical farm allows means that you've got essentially a closed system, um, which means that your inputs are reduced. And so it's predictable. It's a predictable system to operate. So you're not going to have sudden shocks hitting you. Um, it's year round. Um, you know, you're onshoring production. Suddenly uh, your sort of season window for production of a particular crop goes from, I don't know, maybe six to seven months um, that you might have made in, in a good season in the UK to 12 months because you're not worried about a change in the weather um, and you're not then being essentially usurped by produce that's coming in from abroad where the climate is more favourable to the production of that crop in like out of UK season. Um, and I think one thing that's really sort of become incredibly uh, sort of like high on my list recently is food manufacturers, supermarkets, they are expressing an interest and desire to incorporate produce from vertical farms into their lines, you know, now. And we need to be able to give them that opportunity. And so this is some, somewhere where I see farmers really benefiting from vertical farming is, you know, there's a desire and a need and a, a pull from from the sector to incorporate this type of produce and so that's an immediate profit benefit an immediate sort of offtake that you could secure in brilliant no thank you that volatility and especially you say the the extreme weather events that's a um is something obviously that's very very pertinent in 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 farmers minds so um no thank you for that I'm going to hand back to Will now, um, who is in charge of questions. So, Will, over to you. Thanks very much. We, we've got a lot of questions. Um, we've got nine. Um, so I, I will try my best to kind of, um, they're, they're for both you directly, um, Jen and Adam. I'll try and balance it well. Um, but I, I guess following on from the, the point just there from you, Jen, 
Um, we've got a question on um, are, are vertical farmed crops, do they require any sort of form of, um, I guess, specification and, and labelling um, to, to get into the, the, the large um, supply chains? So at the moment, there's no specific labelling for vertically farmed produce. Um, obviously, you know, things like leaf mark people are looking for um, and vertical farms can be leaf mark accredited. Um, there's other, you know, obviously other industry sort of labels that people look for and vertical farms can be accredited with those too. Um, but no, there's no specific sort of like labelling that says this has come from a non sort of non-traditional agricultural yeah. method. Um, there's no, none of that's required. Um, what people want to do and some of the retailers are looking to do is specifically label it as coming from indoor farming or vertical farming. And they're looking to create brands around this. Um, this has been done quite uh, impressively in the US. If you see brands uh, coming from farms like Plenty and Bowery, uh, they have huge brands associated with their farm production. Um, and that's been incredibly successful. And that's something that you can see retailers uh, in the UK and Europe are looking to replicate over here now. Okay, quite exciting. Thanks very much. Um, we'll, we'll shift over to Adam. Um, so what, why did you choose crickets over wheel mealworms? Um, and, and mealworms seem to be the most talked about species currently that, that is farmed. So, so why crickets over mealworms? Well, really because the um, I, I, from the start, I was looking at producing insects for human consumption. Um, and there's a, uh, a definite um, difference between people's willingness to consume certain species of insects. So quite near the top of the list, my name, you know, Relative to other foods, perhaps it's near the bottom of some other, yeah, some people's lists. But um, it, you know, relative to other insect species, crickets and locusts are fairly near the top of the list. Um, then you've probably got something like mealworms, which uh, you know, with the name and their appearance, people are perhaps more put off by. I think, in some ways, people also associate meal. You know, they they'll think of feeding mealworms to the chickens or wild birds and, and maybe see them less as, as a, a food for people. Um, and then, you know, near the bottom of the list, you have um, something like black soldier fly larvae. So I, Will, I'd, I'd probably argue that black soldier fly larvae have seen more attention and uh, have more investment than the mealworms. Um, but they are a fly larvae, a maggot essentially, and trying to persuade people um, to eat something which is a maggot uh, is, is, you know, even though nutritionally they might be ideal, is just is a really tough sell. So crickets were a good compromise. Wow, I, I don't mind giving it a go. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll admit it, you're very persuasive. Um, well, we'll link on to another from that uh, to you, Adam, with a question on. The biosecurity. Um, so, are, are there any any biosecurity risks of insect flying? I, I'm imagining, you know, what if they all escape and you just completely changed? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, not really. I mean, the, the 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 there is a risk of insects escaping into the environment, and I think it would only be sensible to take steps to avoid that. Um, in terms of you know, there actually being rules, regulations in place to prevent that happening, they don't really exist. And I think uh, in the UK, at least, and I think one reason for that is that most of the species uh, that are being farmed are um, tropical species that, that would not survive, um, would not overwinter in the UK. So the chances of them ever becoming a, a uh, a, a pest in, in the wild environment would, uh, you know, would be very small. I think where there is a slight risk um, would be in insects um, from a farmed environment escaping into another uh, livestock farming environment. So if you're looking at, say, the lesser mealworm, um, that is already a recognized pest in uh, poultry systems. I think it's called the litter beetle there. And so I suppose if, you know, if you were to have a, a lesser mealworm facility and a poultry facility very close to each other, there would be quite significant potential for some, uh, you know, some issues there in terms of uh, the lesser mealworm being a pest. Um, but 
farming insects, I think you, one of the things you would be most concerned about is um, introducing disease and pests into the farming system. And the steps you would take, uh, biosecurity steps you would take to prevent any incoming um, pest or disease uh, would also serve to prevent uh, insects from escaping into the environment. Yeah, thanks very much. That was um, very uh, a, a good detailed answer. So thank you. We'll, we'll jump back to, to Jen. Um, so do you see any future for um, root crop production within vertical farming? So th this is when Vicky will have a little chuckle because my background is actually potatoes and I am very excited to get root crops into vertical farms. Um, potatoes is quite a good example. Um, they have been successfully produced in vertical farms for seed potato production. So this isn't for um, like where, but for seed. Um, and by producing seed potatoes in a vertical farm, essentially you're at sort of the highest level of seed certification. It, there's, there's zero contamination from soil because we don't have the soil. Um, particularly in our systems, we use aeroponics. Um, some of the best seed potatoes in the world are actually produced aeroponically. Um, and so, you know, there's a real opportunity um, for using systems like ours to produce seed potatoes. Um, we've been doing some work recently, I actually showed Vicky some pictures of this a, few, a couple of weeks ago when we met up in London. Um, we've been doing some work on looking at growing root vegetables, things like carrots and parsnips. Um, and they do grow incredibly well on our systems. Um, it is very much in the research phase. Um, we haven't yet worked on the economics of it. We're just at the moment seeing, can we get it to work? How do we get it to work? And once we've got the sort of like, can we and how, how do we, that's when we start working on the, how do we make this like economically feasible? Um, so at the moment, we're very much in the research phase, but it's, I can honestly say, I've had carrots in my hand from a vertical farm. They tasted delicious. Um, and so it's something that, we hope we'll be able to bring to market soon. Wow, thanks very much. I guess watch, watch this space. Um, vertical farm carrots, fabulous. Um, and then an another question for you, Jen. Um, how are the economics of vertical farming currently stacking up? So uh, there, there's a lot of, of different forms of investment and capital funding moving towards you. Um, but w will it sustain vertical farming for, for the long run? Um, if, if they're not already. So I suppose the first thing to say is when venture capital funds invest, you know, they are looking for a return on their investment at some point. Um, and typically, you know, that it's it's not a you know immediate short term investment return, but they are looking for it in the medium term. Um, so you know, VC funds are seeing it as a profitable enterprise. And we actually work very, very closely with our clients to understand what they're looking to grow what the markets they're selling into, what kind of prices they're looking to achieve or are able to achieve, what sort of length of offtake agreements have they got? You know, are they looking at sort of like one or two year offtakes or are they looking at sort of much longer sort of five to seven year offtake agreements? Um, and what we then do is we work with them very closely. We understand um, how much their energy costs are, what their water costs are, where they can make savings. Um, we help them in that sense. And then we do the full business model um, taking into account employment costs, like everything that would cost for operational, uh, operating the facility, as well as everything that it costs capitally to put that facility in place. And typically we, we look to support and work with projects that have a payback. So you're in profit operationally after around sort of five, sort of the five year mark. Um, so they do require capital input, but there are an awful lot of funders who are looking to support that and make that investment and um, so some of the much larger farms that we're building at the moment they are working with uh, strategic investment funds who are putting that capital forward so it's not necessarily the farmer that's taking the capital risk it's it's a as an investor taking the capital risk um, and then you know, we're looking to get that farm into profitability um, in sort of like within sort of five years or so to make sure that the capital is paid off and the farmers weren't making money out of it okay Thank you very much. We, I reckon we've got time for one more and I'll, I'll pose it to both of you. Um, I guess a, a one sentence answer in that how and why would a farmer get involved in, in vertical farming and insect farming? Uh, I guess, uh, Adam, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think um, 
The why uh, I touched on before in that an, a, a, an ex a farming business um, would likely see the potential in being able to um, uh, shorten supply chains and potentially produce a, um, a, a product that is not uh, yet a commodity and something which um, the farmer could uh, you know, set the price at, on and uh, and potentially build a brand around, like Jen mentioned, the importance of building a brand. And I think that's much easier when you've got something that isn't a, a commodity. Um, and in, in terms of how they would go about getting into it, certainly on the animal feed side, there are more and more um, uh, sort of or basically off the shelf products available. Um, the, the equipment you would need, the advice you would need for setting up a building is there. On the human consumption side, um, it's uh, there are less companies working in the space and it would be more difficult to get something set up, but the, the support is there. I mean, I'm also a director of um, what was the Woven Network and now the um, UK Association for Edible Insects. And there are organizations like that that people can join, um, which uh, are, are perfect for, for networking and just getting the information you need to sort of get your, your foot in the door with it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. And then, uh, Jen, the, the same question to you, how, how and why to get involved? I'll do I'll do the I'll do the why to start with. And I would say that's, you know, it's just looking at your resilience and diversifying your uh, sort of like methodologies of production, which, again, improves your resilience. Um, the how? Pick up the phone. Give us a call. Um, you know, contact get in contact with technology providers like Vertical Future. Um, we can, you know, help you and guide you down that path. Um, we understand that this is a really it's a very new technology and it's something that many people haven't worked with before. Um, so we're able to handhold um, throughout the whole process. And it's not just the process of building a farm and commissioning it. Um, we provide an awful lot of data that supports the growing process as well. So we can give you idealized recipes for production of whatever crops you're looking for. Um, I have a team of plant scientists who spend their days working on systems like the one behind me to optimize how to grow a crop um, to get it to the specifications that your buyer is looking for. And so we're able to support you throughout that journey. Great, thank you very much. And on, on that point, um, open arms note from both of you, I, I thank you very much for, for joining and for such an interesting talk and insights from you both. And, and thank you um, to Vicky for, for sharing as well. Um, well. We'll try and get any, any remaining questions answered as well and, and get those over to the audience. But again, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, we'll leave it there um, and I hope to see you at the next surgery.